You're listening to Investify, preaching financial independence and assisting investors to achieve a more flexible and free lifestyle through smart financial planning and real estate investing. If leaving the corporate world and jumping into this thriving industry is what you desire, tune in and listen to stories of like-minded individuals who made the leap to financial independence. Equip yourself with the right tips and tricks to start your real estate journey, making active or passive ventures that are highly profitable and rewarding. Here are your hosts, Craig Kerlop and Ziana McIntyre. What's going on, everybody? You are listening to Investify. My name is Craig Kerlop, aka The Fi Guy, and I'm here with my co host, Ziana McIntyre, aka Z Money. Z, how are you doing today? I am doing great. You know, it is raining, drizzling outside my window, and that kind of makes me think of Seattle. Hmm. <laughs> I heard that the bluest skies are in Seattle. Have you heard that song? No. Craig, oh, I gave you like a, a great opening. Why'd you mess it up? <laughs> no, I'm just trying to, you know, there's a there's a nice song from like the 30s or 40s that is like the bluest guys I've ever seen are in Seattle. Anyway, um, we, you know what else is in Seattle? Is the Phi team is moving to Seattle. Not moving, but we're expanding. Expanding. Expanding to Seattle. And our amazing guest, Eric Yu, today is our first agent out there. And he's a STR, short term rental Airbnb expert, and a real estate agent. And he's here to help people in the Seattle area achieve financial independence through real estate investing, just as we have done in Denver and continue to do. Uh, we're just copy and pasting that into Seattle. And so we're so excited to have him on board. He's got a great story. And I'm really excited to have him, you know, have him. I'm here. Z, what do you got to say? Well, what I want to say is that, like Craig, I have an agent out in Houston. And so if you guys are looking for investor-friendly markets or you want investor-friendly agents, reach out to us because I have a whole spreadsheet, I imagine Craig does as well, of agents that we have great relationships with and teams that are vetted um, that can really help you kind of like, I don't know, do it quicker right because when you've got the right team in place you really make a lot less mistakes that's right the great team right i think really the right real estate agent will have an answer to a lot of your questions because the agents know well not only do they know the markets they know the numbers and if they have deals themselves then they know like what mortgage rates are and all that but they're going to know the best lenders the best contractors that they're, they're they're always in the know they're, they're, their job is to be the connector so definitely get yourself a good yeah. real estate agent whenever market you're in and reach out to us you know if it's in seattle reach out to eric and if not or denver um yeah reach out to me or z and we'll help you out but let's get into the show with eric you Eric, you welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, Craig, thanks for having today? me. I'm uh, having a great day so far out here in cloudy Seattle, where the summer is uh, basically ending. Cloudy Seattle, you don't hear that too much, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah, man. Um, well, dude, thanks so much for coming on. Um, we've got some exciting news that we'll talk about towards the end of this episode. But before we get there, let's take it from the beginning and hear how you first heard about financial independence. Yeah, for sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna go back a couple of years. Um, give a little bit more background as well where I uh, where I started off at. So out of college, I was working in big tech for about four years. Did computer science and uh, did software out at Instagram. And I think like you know early on, you know out of college, everyone's having a good time in their jobs, thinking nine to five is the only thing that they have to do. But it was really around COVID in 2020 when I started reevaluating all of that. So I, I think a lot of people had this happen where they were living in their one bedroom apartments, paying more than $3,000 in rent and realizing, what the hell am I doing paying $3,000 in rent? So my girlfriend and I that year, we, uh, we went and we did a life planning retreat and basically wanted to talk about, you know, what, what do we care about? What do we want to do? Do we want to work these jobs for the next five years, next 10 years, or do we want to find out you know, some other way to live. So that's when I first uh, came across, you know, financial freedom and passive income. At the time, it was drop shipping, e-commerce, you know, everything that you see gurus talk about online. 
Um, but then we came across Airbnb rental arbitrage as a play. So that was the thing that I like first started looking into the most. And that's, you know, right around 2020 time when I really got into it. Can you just explain a little bit as to what Airbnb arbitrage is and what, uh, like what led you to that? Yeah, for sure. So I, uh, I spent a lot of time exploring that and I, <laughs> funny enough, I never acquired an arbitrage unit of my own and I'll get into that in a moment, but basically Airbnb arbitrage is where you work with a landlord or maybe even a property management company at a building and you negotiate to lease out their properties and then re-rent them on Airbnb. So whatever your spread you get on top of the rent to Airbnb income, that's your monthly profit. So there's a lot of people out there that do really well with this model. I'm curious why you didn't go that route. Yeah, so after the uh, the life retreat, I, I actually put in my two weeks notice at Facebook to uh, build out a rental arbitrage company. So this was in, uh, I'll say like early March 2020. So our, our retreat was a little before that. But in early March, uh, I put in my two weeks notice and then COVID became much bigger and everything was shutting down. San Francisco locked down, New York locked down. And my friends that were doing Airbnb at the time, they saw their next two months go from 80% occupancy to basically near zero. So at the time I was like, whoa, this is like the universe sending me a sign that I probably shouldn't be taking this step right now. So I put it on pause and I actually had to go back to my manager and ask him for my job back, which is a little awkward, right? Because we did like a goodbye party. They got me cards, the cake, the whole thing. Um, <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, <laughs> but I uh, I ended up going back into work um, and, you know, from there, I'm actually kind of glad it played out like that because I was pretty dead set on the arbitrage model without thinking about acquiring properties. But now that uh, we've bought a few properties ourselves, I'm much more in favor of the acquire properties for Airbnb versus arbitrage. Okay, I am super in the same boat and I just like want you to say why. Because okay. I just think there's so many more benefits and like people need to own. So yeah, I know. Why. Yeah, no, no, for sure. You know, that that's the other thing. Like last year on TikTok, I feel like there was a lot of these like Airbnb rental arbitrage people that started popping up talking about, oh, this is like your get rich quick scheme kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But there's, you know, there's those three main benefits to real estate. You've got appreciation, depreciation, cash flow. Rental arbitrage really only gives you cash flow. So you're missing out on two of the other big factors. And then the other thing, and I think this is the one that I don't love, you're always kind of at the mercy of your landlord. So I've got a friend who's been doing arbitrage for three or four years now. And on one of the properties, the landlord just called it and didn't want to release again. So all that effort, all that time building that business, all gone and she has to start over again. So it's like, yeah, I, I get if you know you want to build it out and build up some cash flow, it's a good way to go. But if you can acquire, I would uh, definitely acquire. Yeah, I think so. One thing I love about all of the Airbnb arbitrage is that it's very synchronistic where you can basically learn to run an Airbnb with someone else's property. You can get cash flow from it. That can be kind of like your side hustle at the same time. You can use that money to then purchase property to make your own Airbnb. And so over time, your, you know, your weight of properties can go from arbitrage to owned Airbnbs and you can easily kind of shift in that way. So I, I do agree with both of you that Arbitrage is not the end game. Arbitrage is just the beginning for people. And then eventually you get into owning it and running Airbnbs yourself. As a landlord, I do, I'm on the landlord side of the Airbnb arbitrage and I will say that I love it. And I am all about having people Airbnb my place and paying me a premium to do so. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I think it. Um, it's kind of like how uh, people start off with wholesaling, right? They find the deals and then they build capital with wholesaling. Mm -hmm. but that's not really the end goal either. It's like, Eventually, you have enough capital to take these deals on for yourself. Right. It's just like people, yeah, and flipping is another way, right? So, like, what is the real estate side hustle? I just think there's nothing more synchronistic than running an Airbnb arbitrage and having an Airbnb. It's the same thing, right? And so, you mm -hmm. can easily just, your systems are all the same and, and it's easy to scale from there. But that, those are my thoughts. And I think, I think, you know, we may have exhausted that. So, um, yeah. 
you've what what else next is there yeah uh so at least in terms on my side after we <laughs> after my little job fiasco and having to go back to work um i i was still very much in the boat of hey like we should find some ways to build passive income financial freedom and it was around this time that i started exploring actually buying real estate so also because of covid we had remote flexibility and we could work anywhere so that that opened up a lot of options where you know san francisco real estate you really not buying a place for less than a million bucks unless you're going for like a studio apartment. Uh, but with remote work, we could kind of expand that search criteria to three hours outside of San Francisco, where if we ever had to go back in, it wasn't going to be that big of a move or a hassle, but it also gave us more affordable housing to consider. Um, so we looked at places like Sacramento, uh, Lodi, Redding, California, which is where we ended up landing in. And uh, oh, I'm yeah, we so started. so interested. I have this whole life about Redding. We're going to get into this later, but like, oh, man. it's okay. nowhere central. So I'm so surprised <laughs> that that's where you ended up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about it. Um, but yeah, we were looking at properties, and that's how we. Uh, got into our first house hack, basically realizing, hey, if we're paying $3,000 in rent at the time when rates were still low, uh, we could buy a place basically up to 600000 and pay the same amount per month. Ooh, all right. The plot thickens. Well, yeah. so tell us about why Reading, because I think when you're, I don't know if you were thinking about Airbnb at that time or if you were just thinking about house hacking and having roommates, but if people don't know about Reading, it's because there's not a lot to know. Basically, there is a big church there that has a school, so there's lots of students around that. And then, I don't know, there's meth heads. What else does Reading have? You tell that, me. That is, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> you're, you're right on point. You're right on point. Um, right. To, to the first question, we were looking at Airbnb still. Uh, but we were like, wow, why can't we combine house hacking with Airbnb? Like, I feel like I saw a lot of people talking about uh, rent by the room, talking about maybe duplexes and multifamily. But we were thinking maybe we could combine Airbnb with this. Um, so not only do we get house hacking experience, we also get the Airbnb operations experience we wanted. Um, so that's that's kind of where we we're at in terms of why Reading. Oh, man. Uh, yes, there's the huge church Bethel out there. Um, there are some naturey things that people go to see, like Shasta Lake, um, Bernie Falls, and Whiskey Town Lake. But the city itself, um, it was it was very interesting. Uh, very you know, very big mix of people that were out there. I would say for us, the main thing was looking at purchase price to revenue and types of returns we could see, and. From all the cities that we looked at, Reading had that best purchase price to revenue ratio. So we're like, okay, you know, we don't have like a great hypothesis yet why they're like grossing so much on Airbnb, but we know that this is like consistent across a lot of properties. So let's try it out. How how are you running all these numbers? And like, did you have a spreadsheet? How are you obtaining the rental information and all that stuff? Yeah. So this was before I knew what a pro forma was. I uh, I just typed in real estate investing calculator and the first thing that popped up on google was calculator.net so that was like my 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 die hard tool that i was using at the time to figure out if the numbers made sense or not um in terms of where we were pulling you know the the estimates projections from other properties uh used a lot of air dna um, if if you're going to be an airbnb investor you should definitely check out air dna it's a great tool that gives a lot of data it is paid Wow, this isn't a paid promotion, but it is an awesome tool. Um, the other tools I used were Rabu, and then there's another one called STR Insights. So I kind of pulled these numbers together from a few different sources and uh, took the the middle of all three as kind of the the target number that we would shoot for. Mm, that's a great way to do it. And I wanted to just say that one thing that's kind of weird is that uh, AirDNA had been kind of the go-to, the diehard numbers, and then Rabu came out, and the numbers are pretty different. So how is that for you? What do you find? Um, have you gone back after and just kind of checked what you actually make to see who was a little more accurate? Yeah, definitely. So what I'll say is all of them were very off. 
uh, compared to what our property oh, ended up making, uh, which I'm I'm so excited to talk about once we talk about that first deal. Uh, but I will say that AirDNA has historically been a bit closer for our future deals than Rabu has been. Um, it really depends. I think like if you're in a smaller market like Reading, uh, AirDNA is probably going to be best. But if you've got a place that's got a lot of properties, let's talk about like Orlando or like the Scottsdales. I think all of the tools work pretty well in the larger markets. Mm. Great. Thanks for uh, refining that for us. So yeah, yeah, let's go into that deal. You know, I bet everybody's really excited to hear your numbers. Um, can you break it down for us? What you paid for the place, what your mortgage was. And Craig is chomping at the bit to say the for real deal. This is the deal that makes you a for real investor. <laughs> for it. sure. You're gonna miss it. Sure. I like slap you through the boots. computer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Let's talk about the numbers. Um, so purchase price on this property was uh, 429k. So uh, we were able to negotiate the seller to pay for all of the closing costs, which I'll talk about in a second as well. Um, and then all in cost on our side for furnishings and the touch-ups that we did was about 15K. So all in with the down payment and furnishings, we were at 35K. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, we did a 5% down owner-occupy loan. Um, so that was like somewhere around 20 grand. Uh, but yeah, all in 35 grand on the deal. In terms of numbers, our like initial projection was going to be between $500 to $1,000 of cash flow per month. We ended up averaging $3,000 of cash flow per month on this first deal. So if you look at the cash on cash, it's technically like 100% cash on cash. Uh, we netted like 36 grand on the 35 grand that we put in. Um, and yeah, that's that's when I knew. That's when I was like, oh my gosh, real estate, Airbnb. Why haven't I done this sooner? Yeah, that, that doesn't account for the appreciation and the loan pay down and the depreciation, all that, right? That's just one aspect of the wealth building that real estate gives you. And so you factor all that in, you're probably looking at two, three, four hundred percent return on your investment in that first year, which again, is why real estate is just so, so amazing. And it's always a good time because you just can't see it. House hacking in particular with that low down payment, because you just can't you just can't get returns like that anywhere else. I just haven't seen it. Yeah, it was yeah. it was awesome. Well, so tell us a little bit about the laws there and then the layout of your house. Were you renting out individual rooms? Did you have like a separate unit area that you guys were living in? How did that work? Yep, for sure. So when we were looking at properties, uh, we, we looked both at, you know, multifamily properties, uh, and uh, houses that had guest houses in the back. So we wanted to make sure that it would be a separate living space. Um, this was mainly just for us because we were still working remotely. We wanted to make sure that we could take meetings in private and there wouldn't be too many disturbances. Um, so the property we ended up landing on had a little guest house out back, completely separate from the main house. It was small though, guys, very, very small. 250 square feet for two people is not enough. I'll tell you that I learned that lesson from house hacking. Uh, I, I thought it'd be okay, but it was a, it was a tough year <laughs> living in the small space. But honestly, I would not trade it because of all the lessons that I learned throughout that time. Um, so yeah, it was set up with that 250 square foot guest house. And then the main house was a three bed, two bath. That was around 1700 square feet. Great. Yeah. So why, well, what do you do now with the 250 square feet? Like, was that rentable? Did you get a student in there or something? It sounds really, really small. I did. I did. So this is the other interesting thing about Reading's real estate market, which is that the inventory for one bed and studio places is so low that they are almost at the same premium as three bed places for long term rentals. So you might see like a thousand to eleven hundred for a studio or one bed. And then for some of the three bed places, it's going to be like sixteen hundred. So it's not like exactly the same, but it's kind of comparable. Uh, so we were able to place someone in there at $900 a month, and it's been great. I'm, we haven't had any issues, and uh, we're actually thinking about turning it into a midterm stay and hosting a traveling nurse there instead. Great. Yeah, so there's a big big hospital or two kind of right in that area. Yeah. And is, is the big house still being rented on Airbnb? So we actually converted that one to a corporate rental as well. 
Uh, the, the long story short is, turns out there was some stuff about the little guest house that wasn't fully permitted. Uh, so while we were living in there, it was okay. But once we turned it into a rental, they needed us to fix everything. So I've been waiting on the building department to get back to me on the, all that. They won't let it be a short-term rental until all those things are corrected. So in the meantime, we've also converted that main house into a uh, midterm rental. Mm. Great. Okay. Um, and how does a midterm rental work in the three bedroom space? Are you finding that you have a lot of demand or not as many because it's a bigger house? Yeah, it's been pretty good, actually. Um, so we've had one family coming to visit Bethel, the church, and they stayed for nine months, actually, which is fantastic. Um, and then the other traveler that we've had has just been a traveling nurse there for two months. So if you do the math, you'll realize that the building department has taken 11 months. So I'm a little salty about that, but I'm still waiting on them to uh, figure things out there. Um, fortunately for us, we've been still making a good enough premium on the midterm rental that we're seeing about one to one and a half thousand in cash flow per month, which I'm bummed because we would do better on Airbnb, but cash flow is still cash flow. Absolutely. And, and that just reemphasizes the importance of having multiple exit strategies for each house, right? So if your plan A of Airbnb doesn't work, hey, at least you've got this plan B of medium term rentals, which maybe doesn't work as well, but it's still good enough where you don't have to sell the property, especially in times like now where the property prices have probably you know declined five, ten percent. Yeah, exactly. All right, cool. well, let's go into your second deal. I'm assuming that you got super excited about that and in a year wanted to bust out of that studio um, and get another place probably still in Reading. Where did you end up? Yeah, so actually, this was before we moved out of the first place. Airbnb had gone so well on the first property that we're like, you know what? I think we have enough saved down to just buy a second property right now with like a 15% down loan. Uh, so my girlfriend and I decided, we've, we saw this house, it was at a great price point, uh, had a pool, and pool properties in Reading do really well. So we're like, we, we got to pull the trigger on this one, even though it's going to be a bit more out of pocket. So for that second deal, it was uh, $338,000. And then it had already been an Airbnb, so we didn't really need to refurnish it. The only stuff that we did to it is we changed out all the carpets for hardwood flooring. And then we also added some nicer patio furniture and did some landscaping. So all in cost on that, 15% uh, down was around 50 grand. The closing cost was around 10 grand. And then the rest of the work was just around seven or eight. So that puts us around like seven, 68 to 70 grand. Okay. Did you, uh, on the hardwood floors, did you put in actual hardwood floors or just like the LVP? Oh yeah. Thanks for clarifying. We did LVP on the flooring. Okay. I was gonna say, cause hardwood floors are probably something you don't want in an Airbnb. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you know, exactly. Some, some water spills on those or something happens. That's, that's expensive. Yeah. Okay, cool. Z, did you have something? I was just thinking, what on earth are you doing in Reading this whole time? Like, are you surviving? Could you make friends? What's happening to little Eric in Reading? Yeah, exactly. Uh, what was happening to Eric in Reading? So I'm out of the 250 square foot guest house. I am struggling to figure out how we do simultaneous meetings because it's studio plus a bathroom. So whenever it was meeting times, uh, my girlfriend and I would alternate. Sometimes I would take the bathroom for meetings. Sometimes she would take the bathroom. <laughs> Not a great situation. Um, <laughs> but... In terms of, you know, just like getting to know the area, it is a slower place than San Francisco, that's for sure. Uh, we still did, you know, pretty well meeting, I guess, folks in real estate. So talking to different agents, uh, there weren't really that many events. So anything that we did go to was a virtual event, which I think a lot of people struggled with this, but our social lives definitely took a hit during this time. Um, I think it was okay because we were so focused on the business and Airbnb and growing that it seemed like the time went by quickly. But now that I'm uh, back in a big city again, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, and I, I love that we're talking about this just, you know, for a second because it's important for people to see that there are some sacrifices sometimes. You know, Craig lived behind a curtain. You moved to nowhere. Um, it's just like sometimes you got to do that to make a little quick buck, but it's temporary, right? So... It's, it's kind of cool when you can make a quick sacrifice and then know that you're setting yourself up for years to come. For sure, yeah. See, what was your sacrifice? 
Uh, I lived between two places for like two years. I literally just lived out of a suitcase, and anytime one place booked, I would go stay at the other place. So I was like, oh I man, go home. oh yeah, man, yeah, you know, whatever. I was had. That's a place. what you got to do, but that's it, right? Like, to, in order, you have to build that solid foundation somehow, and, and you got to get ahead. And usually, it's uh, delayed gratification, right? Y- you know, it's so funny you say that because we were getting kind of fed up living in the small guest house. That we were like, you know what? Maybe it'll be better if we block off a couple days at the second property that we purchased and just like live there a couple days to have a bit more space and then move back. We did that for about two or three weeks and we we're just like, no, no, like we're tired of this back and forth moving. We're tired of having to pack our bags, go over. And then the bigger, biggest thing was every time after we were at the new property, we'd also have to clean it and get it back to being ready for Airbnb standards. So major, major props to you for, uh, for doing that. Yeah, you just have to kind of like live lightly, like you don't actually live there. Well, it is 22 minutes into the show, and so we're going to take a small break. So guys, we are training you now that we are going to start advertising in this mid part of the show. But today, I will be the ad. Um, I wanted to just let you all know that if you're interested in Airbnb and have not gotten into it because you're afraid or you don't know enough, I still do one-on-one sessions and I know that I will not do that forever. So if you're interested in learning more about becoming a co-host, or starting your own Airbnb business, reach out to me and maybe we can get you there. Back to the show. All right, guys. So what next? Did you ever actually get out of the studio? It sounds like you did because now you're in a city. Big city I did. Eric. I did. So it was my th- third deal when I finally moved out of the guest house. So we had been in the guest house for exactly a year. And then we decided to get the third property, which it didn't have a separate unit, but it had an above garage unit. This one was double the size of what we had. So we are now living luxury in 500 square feet. Um, oh, damn. Yeah, right. It was, it was great. Um, living above your means now. Yeah, we could at least have a kitchenette now. So that was great. Um, so we, we, yeah, living out of there was perfectly fine. Um, had no complaints, loved it. Um, and then after living there for a while, we made the move up to Seattle. So all in right now, we've got our, uh, three properties, but five units total. So we've got the two main houses, um, that are renting on Airbnb, two for corporate travel, and then one for long-term travel. And it was at that point that we were actually hitting roughly between, I guess on slow months, about 6K net, and then on high season months, around 12K net. So it averaged around like 8 to 9K net per month. Um, At that point is when I decided to quit my job and go into real estate full time. Ah, that's where it all comes together. Well, before we skip all the way over your third deal, let's just hear like a little bit of the numbers because people love that. Um, yeah. so five units because this one has a second unit. So just, uh, tell us how that all came together. Yeah, for sure. I think we overpaid on this one. This was probably at the peak of, um, honestly, like the peak of the real estate market as a whole. Uh, so this one was 450 K in total. It was about 2000 square feet, 500 for the top unit, 1500 for the downstairs unit. Uh, this one really didn't need any rehab. All we did was painted some walls and we switched out two or three lighting fixtures. So very low cost of rehab. And then the one thing we did to juice it up is we added a hot tub at this property. So similar to the first house, 5% down, we did pay for closing costs. And then uh, furnishings with hot tub all in, I think was around 17K or so. So what's the math on that? Probably around 50K or so invested into this deal. And then we're seeing about two to two and a half net from the Airbnb. And now that we've moved out, that top unit for corporate travelers is bringing in about 2000 as well per month. Wow, that's awesome. So I think it's cool to just kind of highlight amenities. So, you know, one of your places has a pool that you said is really popular for Reading. This other place, you got a hot tub. Both of them are kind of annoying to maintain. So can you talk a little bit about that and then how much you kind of feel they help you, you know, get more bookings? Yeah, there's there's definitely pros and cons to it. I think it's been a big benefit when it comes to our average daily rate. We're definitely able to charge a premium. Uh, 
like you said, though, see, the, the main issue is the maintenance side of things. And if maintenance doesn't go well, it ends up being more of a bad thing than a good thing. So, for example, sometimes because our pool guy comes once a week and then when there's a lot of guests, I ask them to come twice a week. Even so, there's sometimes that there's just algae in the pool or, you know, maybe it doesn't clear up in time. And as a result, we've gotten some bad reviews from that. I almost wonder, like, after everything, like, yes, we see the numbers and we do net more on the pool house, but the, like, bad reviews, I don't know how they'll impact us over the long term from the pool. So I like it because I'm getting a lot higher rates right now, but it is one of those things where I'm, like, a little stressed about thinking just because if the maintenance people don't do a good job, that liability ends up falling on me. Yeah. I have a question for you, Eric. I uh, kind of bring it back a little bit. You know, you kind of mentioned... And you put like 70K down on your second house, 50K down on this one. Where are you coming up with all this like cash? Is that just savings from your job or? Yeah, good question. Um, so I was fortunate to have a pretty nice tech salary. Um, and I, I think for the first four years out of college, I really tried to live below my means. So I was basically saving probably 80 to 85% of my take home pay per month. Um, so all of that money for the first four years ended up going toward these deals. At the time, I didn't know if I would put this money toward real estate or not, but now I'm glad I saved it up and had the funds to, to take on these deals. Mm. So that's just, that's the importance of, you know, when you are in that W-2 role, saving a very high percentage of your income, 80, because that gives you the leverage to do bigger and better things later. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's awesome, man. Cool. So you've got these basically five units, three properties kind of in the Reading area, um, all of which are short, medium, long. I mean, you're kind of like you know, dabbling in all. all. Yeah, it all. got to try them all. Uh, uh, it, not yeah. really any long term because they're all furnished, right? So that's good. That is true. Yeah. That's true. Even your long term is kind of like a medium term, right? That's the nine month uh, Bethel house. Yeah. Uh, and so what what prompted the move? It sounds like you moved to, up to Seattle. Uh, what prompted that move? Well, there's not much in Reading. I'll, uh, I'll start there again. But uh, one of the big things that my girlfriend and I realized is, you know, we didn't want to go back to the Bay Area. So it was sometime last year when we realized, like, hey, return to work is going to be happening soon. Is the Bay Area the right spot that we want to be? So we went on a little mini city tour. Uh, we checked out Raleigh, North Carolina, and then we had a bunch more on the list. But after visiting Seattle as the second destination, I feel like it was one of those things where stars kind of aligned. We met the right people while we were here, went to the right events, and everything was just fantastic. So we had our little stay here, and then the week after our stay, we just packed up our bags and moved everything up. Mm. Oh, that's so exciting. So what prompted you to want to be a real estate agent? Because I know for me, I got my license during COVID kind of at that same moment that you mentioned where it was like all the Airbnb listings just kind of took a dive. And I was like, whoa, I better do something else. And Selling Sunset came out and I watched all of that. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm wondering what was your Selling Sunset, Eric? <laughs> oh my gosh. It's funny because I also watched Selling Sunset and I'm planning on making this... <laughs> Uh, this TikTok video at some point about it, but oh man, uh, why did I become a real estate agent? So after quitting my job last year, that was um, back in 2021, I, I honestly, I just took two months off and didn't really do much. Um, I, I tried to get started on a lot of projects, but I think mentally I just needed some time to recharge after four years of the corporate grind. Um, and then after that soul searching period, I started thinking about what I want to do next. You know, I think a lot of people glorify the idea of financial independence and they always tack on the retire early part. I don't buy into the fire movement personally. I really like the FI part of the movement, but I think once people experience not having anything to do or retirement, it actually can get pretty boring pretty quickly. Um, and that's one of the things that I noticed where it's like, I thought I would have a lot of fun doing nothing, going to play golf every day, play tennis, but I completely lost the community aspect. So one of the big things that I took away from that is I want to make sure I'm plugged in and helping out communities and helping out people in my day-to-day, -day, uh, just my day-to-day -day experiences. So at least on like the real estate agent side of things, I saw what Airbnb did for me, at least in unlocking this freedom to choose what I want to do. 
and I could see how I could help other people that way as well. So I started by positioning myself as like a real estate agent, friend, investor person that you could come talk to about Airbnb. And from there, I yeah got my license and sold a couple of Airbnb properties to, to friends and family. I love it. Yeah. Nice, man. And what made you seek out and join the Fi team? Yeah, so I had just come to Seattle. Um, and so I had my California license, but I was like, you know, what? I want to keep focusing on real estate in Washington as well. And I want to make sure that what I'm doing still ties into my original goals, which is helping people start building towards financial independence or acquiring investment properties. I'm more than happy to help your, you know, more typical retail buyers as well. But just, I feel passionate about helping other people toward the financial journey and the financial independence journey. Um, so. I, funny enough, uh, there was a uh, Br there was a guy out here, Bradley. He's a part of House Hack Seattle. He had met you, Craig, a little while back in Denver, and I actually remember I read your book way back, back in like early 2020 as well. I was like, oh yeah, Craig, I remember Craig, um, and I reached out to you, DM'd you on Instagram. Didn't, didn't know if you would respond to me. I, I mean, you've got those 28,000 followers, so I'm sure your inbox is always full. Uh, but, you know, you responded. We hopped on a call, and I realized of all the teams I was talking to, the mission that you guys have and the mission that the Fi team has uh, to help people in this way really aligns with what I want to do. So, you know, rather than trying to build it out myself here, why not work with people that have already been really established and been successful in the space? And it's been a harmonious synergy ever since. Yeah, it's been great. And uh, we're so excited to, to kind of get moving in Seattle because I just think Seattle and Denver, I think those markets are so similar. And really, like our, our mission with our team is to reduce the U.S. retirement age, right? Like that's like our big, hairy, audacious goal. That seems almost impossible. Uh, reduce it from 65 to 55. So nice. that's taken 10 years off in our time. And I think a great way to do that is by helping people achieve financial independence through real estate investing, which is our you know, ultimate thing. And uh, yeah, man, it's so happy. It's so, so exciting to have you on board. Yeah, for sure. And I'm happy to be here. If you guys haven't listened to the episode with Todd Baldwin, he is in the Seattle area doing house hacking. And so that was a really, really cool episode on Investify. We'll put it in the show notes, but definitely go check that out to learn more about what is possible in the Seattle area and then reach out to Eric. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you, and listen to the end of the show where we ask Eric how to reach out to him. And that's how you get the info. But <laughs> so we leave that for you at the end. Um, is there anything else we want to touch on before we head into the final four? All right, Eric, before we head into the final four, do you have any parting words of wisdom for the audience? I mean, I think the big thing is just taking action and getting started. I think I was definitely in a phase of analysis paralysis in the past. And honestly, there's no perfect deal out there, guys. You just got to try and then you'll learn a lot along the way. And as Craig mentioned earlier in the show, as long as you've got the as long as you've got multiple exit strategies, it will work out. So just go out there and get cranking. Yeah, I remember hearing on, on Bigger Pockets when I was first listening, and you know, it's like, okay, you need to get at least $100 a door, and you need to get it at this price, and you need to get it with this vacancy rate, and this, and it had all the numbers, and I, every deal I analyzed wouldn't be right. And I was like, oh my God, actually, you, you're never going to check all the boxes. And it's so important to take action or just trying to check all the boxes because eventually all those boxes will be checked. Mm -hmm. So I love that you said that. Yeah, and they change. All right. They change with the market all yeah. the time. So, yeah, you can't, can't keep to certain boxes. Just, yeah, get break out of the box and buy real estate. <laughs> um, and we will head into our... The final four. All right, Eric, what are you reading right now? Yeah, I actually just started this book called Systemology. So I got it recommended. It's uh, it's just a book all about how to build the right systems in your business so that at some point when you do want to like take more vacations and be able to unplug yourself for a couple days, you've got your team and everything running so that things don't fall apart basically and you aren't the cog that breaks the whole machine. Um, so pretty interesting so far. I'm on page two. Right. Well, we'll have to hear about that later. <laughs> How do you read only two pages? <laughs> <laughs> I, I started, I, I opened the book and then I got a client call and then I just had to put the book down. So I'm, I'm excited to dive more okay. into it. Fair enough. Fair enough. I was like, what in the heck? That's what happens when you're a real estate agent. Uh, always on, always off. Yeah. 
Uh, same question, Eric. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Yeah, same person told me both of these things. Uh, one of them was stop comparing your middle to someone else's. Uh, wow, I totally botched that. Stop comparing your beginning to someone else's middle, um, and that things take time. I think you know on social media we see a lot of people that are like way further along in their journeys and. I think you know in this digital age, a lot of us think like, oh shit, we should be able to get to that uh, that area really quickly too. But these people are spending you know three, four, maybe five years to get there. So take your time on these things. And then the other thing, and I think this one's been pretty formative for me, is if you want things bad enough, you'll find a way. If not, you'll find an excuse. So a lot of it is around your mindset and mentality towards things. Because if you really believe in what you're doing. You're gonna figure it out no matter what, but it is very easy to give yourself that way out and those excuses as well. Hmm. Hmm. I love that. All right, question number three: What is your why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this has changed a lot in the past two years. I thought my why was financial for a little bit. Um, check out Thirty K by Thirty Journey. That was uh, where I first started on this financial independence journey. But I, I thought it was all about just creating passive income and then retiring. But now I've very much realized that it's about community building, helping my community, helping people uh, build toward this as well. So I would say my main why is really growing community. And then, of course, in addition to that, uh, it's about family as well. Mm -hmm. Great. If you could remove a color from this world, which color would it be? You know, I was wondering what this surprise question would be. I had no <laughs> idea what, what it could be. Interesting. I had to remove one color from the world. I'm going to say bright hot pink. I am very happy to not have that. I love that color. Oh man, controversial yes. opinion over here. <laughs> yeah, I, I disagree with that one. See, what's yours? I feel like you were thinking about it there. I was thinking about it. I was just thinking like the only color is like maybe brown, but then I was like, what are brown things gonna be? So I, I don't want any. You know what they would be? They'd be gone. bright hot pink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Imagine if like dirt and poop. Was bright. My <laughs> hair would be bright hot pink. I was thinking about my hair too. Of course, you're going right to the yeah. poop, Greg. God. Yeah, that's, that's where I go. Um, all right, Eric, where can people find out more about you? You alluded to a meetup. I think you might have an IG. Where else? T tell, get, spill the beans. Yeah, so I'm out here in Seattle now. Uh, I'm going to start hosting a monthly meetup. So stay in tune for that. It's looking like it'll be the third Thursday of every month, but still figuring out the exact timing. In terms of on socials, you can find me everywhere at hello, Eric, you. Uh, you is spelled Y-U. And I'm, I'm sure it'll be in the show notes as well. Yes, 100%. Awesome, Eric, man. It's so exciting to have you on the show. So exciting to have you on board the team and being our first agent in Seattle which is super exciting, the launch of the Seattle Fi team. And again, taking us one step closer to helping more and more people achieve financial independence through real estate investing. Thanks so much for coming on, man. It was great to have you. Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much, you both, for having me on here. And that was Eric Uzi. What did you think of Eric? Well, that was such a fun episode because obviously it's all about Airbnb and I'm all about Airbnb. So I just got, I just got to sink my teeth into them, you know? Yeah. Um, and... I have a history with red in California because my father used to grow marijuana there. Um, and so, yeah, it was uh, definitely interesting to hear about how that market does. Um, offline, Eric did tell us that they are kind of renegotiating their short-term rental laws. So it might not be the best place if you're not already in that market, but it's just giving you some ideas of how to get creative when you're kind of looking outside of cities to see kind of smaller places around. So yeah, it was a really great episode. Yeah, and I think it just goes to show that you don't need to be in a big city to make Airbnb work, right? Like you can be Absolutely. in a tier four, tier five city town and still make a lot of money on Airbnb. So if you're sitting here in wherever Arkansas and, and you, you know, you're you an hour outside of Little Rock or whatever the biggest city is in there, like you can still do Airbnb in your town. And I'm sure there are still people passing through, there are still people visiting that city. So I think that's, Super important takeaway as well. And I was super excited because I'm just like so excited to launch the Fi team in Seattle. Uh, I think Seattle is just such an amazing market. And I think Eric is like such a great, great guy to kind of spearhead that because he's got the, that experience and he's such a good, well to do guy. Yeah. Yeah. Eric just seems really approachable and just kind of like, 
humble. You know, he would share all his numbers. And I think like what's great about financially independent agents is that they're not as hungry, right? It seems more that he's driven by helping and uh, just seeing people develop and get closer to their FI, um, that it's not really like he needs the commission as badly. So I appreciated that. Yeah, I think I never thought of it that way, but I think that's totally true. Because yeah, it's right. Like we don't need the we don't need the next paycheck. We just want you to make like that's more fulfilling, right? The more fulfilling thing is seeing people hit that financial independence mark and be like, hey, I was part of your journey, right? I think that's yeah. super cool. So, all right, Z, should we get out of here, or should Let's we ask everybody do. for a rating and review on iTunes? Please, 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 guys, uh, drop us a rating, give us the five stars, hit us up on Instagram. Uh, I'm the five guys. Yana is Yana McIntyre. And just let us know how we're doing. You know, any way we can improve the show, we'd love to see the engagement. So thanks so much, guys, for, uh, for listening. And we'll see you all next week. Bye. That's it for this episode of Investify. We hope that these nuggets of real estate wisdom lead to more savvy financial planning and a clearer path towards financial freedom. For more content like this, subscribe to the show at investify.com. Don't forget to leave a rating and share it with your friends. Together, we can transform more real estate newbies into successful and clever investors. Thank you so much for listening. See you on the next one.